So you're gonna show where where you stretch all those people? So you're gonna show us well, the dungeon? I might try to show a move or two. Yeah. I'll take some moves, sir. Ah! Can you feel that? Oh, oh yes, yeah, sir. I don't feel my arms, sir. I can feel it. Ah! Can you, ah! Can you feel that, sir? Oh yes, sir. Red hair, oh yeah. Rosy. Yes, yeah, sir. Ah! And by taking this arm back here, no. and you just ease this hand ah! in the position here. Ah! I got the power here to stop it, sir. Stop. Ah! You're listening to Heartbeat Radio. Bob Johnson coming to you live from the Heartbeat Radio Studios, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. We have a great show for you guys this afternoon. One of the most legendary. Uh, superstars ever, the sensational destroyer, Dick Byer, and joining Dick, he's the son of the great, uh, late great Buffalo wrestler Ilio DiPolo, uh, Dennis DiPolo. I met Dennis at the Cauliflower Alley Club a couple of years ago, and uh, Dennis is going to share some uh, stories about his dad and uh, Dick and a few things. But what, before I introduce those guys, without any further ado, I would like to first of all introduce our co-host, Portland Wrestling, Mr. Matt Mers. Welcome, Matt, to Heartbeat Radio. Well, it's always a pleasure to start my Saturdays in the Great Pacific Northwest off with Heartbeat Radio. Good to hear your voice, Bob, and uh, looking forward to what should be a fascinating discussion about wrestling's history with Mr. Meyer. I'd like to introduce our host of the show, uh, wrestler, uh, trainer, booker, uh, extraordinaire, uh, Mr. Bruce Hart, welcome back to Heartbeat Radio, Bruce. Yeah, I'm uh, delighted to have both Dick and uh, and Dennis. You know, uh, both I have great respect for. They uh, very well respected the uh, Dick and the wrestling community. And Dennis's father, uh, Ilya, was a beloved icon in the uh, 50s and 60s, and during that uh, stretch. So. I know I've got lots of uh, things I'd love to look forward to talking to them about, you know, and uh, it should be a, a really fascinating show, as you said. This is the son of the late, great Buffalo wrestler, Ilya DePolo, Dennis DePolo. I understand they've got one of the best restaurants in Buffalo. I've heard next time I go to Buffalo, I'm going to have to check out that restaurant, DePolo's Restaurant. You told me the food is fantastic. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you, Bob. I appreciate you having me on and, and remembering my father. It's a, I'm especially honored to, to be on this great show. Um, it's easy. I get Often uh, Bruce get asked a lot, Dennis, how come you didn't go into uh, pro wrestling? And, and I said, uh, my father always told me it was easier to feed him than beat him up. So we've always so we've been in the restaurant business now for <laughs> 52 years. <laughs> so, you know, so it was... Uh, it was always interesting, but no, his whole goal was, you know, it's, it's, when he knew it was time to get out of wrestling, he never wanted to be hungry like he was in Italy, and the best way to do that was uh, to open up a restaurant, and like I said, the Destroyer's been uh, uh, the second father to us here in Buffalo, New York, and our family um, over, you know, the past, uh, since since we were kids, and uh, we're extremely honored to be uh, both of us on the show today with you. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce now our uh, our guest, international wrestling icon, Please welcome the sensational and intelligent The Destroyer, Dick Byer. Welcome, Dick. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think you kind of mentioned Ilio Di Paolo's restaurant as being one of the best. It is the best. Uh, you can't go to any place in western New York that's any better food than uh, Ilio Di Paolo's restaurant. And these people that are listening, I'm as close to being a Canadian as uh, Dennis is. We're right on the Niagara River, which uh, borders Canada and the United States. So we're kind of like Canadians. And uh, you Canadians, if you come across the Peace Bridge... And uh, just head a little bit south. You'll run right into Dennis's restaurant, Ilio De Paolo's restaurant. It's great. My dad always had the, uh, the greatest respect and regard for you. You know, I think, as I said before, he was he was always endeavoring to get you up here. But he told me you were making too much money in uh, Minneapolis, <laughs> some of those places. <laughs> so he couldn't. Uh, 
I kind of get you up here, but I remember he was always uh, a huge fan of yours, and he had a lot of your uh, your buddies up here. I guess back in the day, some of the Japanese guys, and uh, he had a few uh, football players that seemed to be buddies of yours from Syracuse yes. in that area. Some guy I remember he had a big guy named Del Benesic who was yeah. I think, with the rough. Rough he, up here. I can remember Al Benesik, uh playing at Syracuse, and uh, he was a great football player. And oh, yeah, I he know was he was. Uh, he spoke very highly of your dad as a promoter and uh, yourself as a wrestler. Back in the CFL, they didn't pay them enough to not have to get an off-season job, so. He had started all these guys like Kaniski and Blanchard and uh, Billy Graham and uh, Angelo Mosca and guys like that. And I think he was uh, he was trying to get Benesic, and I think it was on and off. And uh, Al maybe uh, ended up getting a higher paying job somewhere else. <laughs> but he, uh, yeah, he was. Uh, Al was always. Uh, I think back in the, that. Era, you were in your heyday. You were like one of the big major stars in, uh, I think, Burns territory. And Al was always uh, dropping your name, and uh, which meant a lot up here, you know. And uh, yeah, Stu was always I'd like to have uh, had Dick up here. I uh, can't seem to get him up here. Dumb <laughs> <laughs> man. Well, the, uh, the the Bruce, when um, we had the the destroyer after they had the tsunami in Japan, we had the great honor of hosting the ambassador of Japan came here to Buffalo, New York, to uh, present um, the destroyer with a national award and national honor um, right here in Western New York for his uh, what they did after the tsunami and the depression that everybody was in. They took the, they had the destroyer come over to Japan. And they put him in, um, in a uh, mobile, um, you know, like the Pope mobile and such. And they drove him oh, through yeah. the destroyed areas and all, and uh, and they, to cheer the people up and to to bring back their spirits and to help to carry on. And they were so uh, so grateful for his presence there and what he did and what he's accomplished. Not only f- for that year, but for the many years that he's been there since from the '60s that uh, they came and gave him a national honor. And I tell you what, I was so uh, honored to be hosting this event. There was over 200 some people here, but the ambassador of Japan. Um, to hear his speech he gave about the destroyer. I mean, we're not talking just the the great wrestler here, but this guy is an international um, phenomenon. It is really a great legend, and we're so honored to have him here as, uh, in Buffalo, New York. I'd like to point out too that Dick was like one of the uh, the trailblazers for mm-hmm. all the American wrestlers to go to Japan, like back back in the early '60s. Uh, yeah. Uh, very, very few of the Americans ever seemed to go over there, and it was it was just kind of taking off. I think Dick was one of the main guys with the legendary Ricky Dozan, who uh, was kind of like the Babe Ruth of Japanese wrestling over there. And Dick was kind of the, uh, from what my dad told me, one of the uh, guys who kind of uh, uh, broke the ice over there and got he got all the uh, American wrestlers into Japan and. A lot of them made a lot of money, but how did that start for you, Dick? Uh, was that through Charlie Moto or uh, that bunch in L.A. when you were there? I was in uh, Los Angeles, uh, and uh, uh, the great Togo and Charlie Moto uh, were uh, the Japanese that were wrestling in the Los Angeles oh. area. Except and for, uh, um, Jewel Strongbow and... Uh, uh, yeah, Jules, Jules was the promoter, and Hardy Kruiskamp was uh, part of the promotion. And um, they asked me to go to Japan. And uh, I said I'd be glad to. And uh, Freddie Blassie, who was a great big friend of mine, uh, he had yeah, the, the WWA heels, title yeah. and uh, dropped it to me, and I went to Japan. And uh, it's funny that we got this phone call right now. A week ago, I got a call from Japan that it was uh, Ricky Dozan's memorial uh, on the radio over there or on television uh, that uh, the match that we had 
uh, was 53 years ago. Uh, so, uh, you know, I got Japan was a great place for me. Uh, it was a, a devastating blow, December the 7th. Uh, and then that was uh, in my early childhood. Uh, and then to get to go to Japan and meet the Japanese people, it was just great. And uh, Ilio and I uh, were in Japan together uh, on one tour, and uh, we had a great time with uh, the Japanese. And I, I was in the right place at the right time, and fortunately I took advantage of it. When did uh, Ricky Dozen... When was he? When was he murdered? Uh, somewhere. That was uh, December fifteenth of nineteen sixty-three. At thirty-nine years of age, quite a so young man way. to have lose his life. It, yeah. it was in a, a nightclub uh, restaurant, and uh, he just got stabbed, and they took him to the hospital. And somebody I heard gave him some uh, milk to drink, and uh, that produced uh, a poison in his system and he passed away that was i had heard that he had uh, gotten in an altercation with uh, a member of the yakuza and uh the blade he was stabbed with i guess was soaked in urine and uh, that contributed to his demise okay i don't know if that's he accurate was... or not but i i don't know exactly either he had uh more or less, uh, Baba and Anoki were kind of young protégés of his, I had heard. Well, they were working started. for the same organization that uh, he was working for. Then Baba and Anoki formed separate groups over there. Yeah, new, uh, Baba was all Japan and... Uh, Anoki was New Japan, I guess. Now, Mr. Byer, is it accurate that you had uh, originally worked Giant Baba at the uh, Olympic Auditorium in early 63 and had, like, three sold-out houses, and that's what uh, kind of led to you going to Japan? Yes, it was. Uh, I knew Baba when he was in Buffalo. Uh, he was uh, wrestling out of Toronto, and uh, when he came... Uh, I'm not sure the territories he worked, but I think uh, Texas was one coming through. And uh, when he got to Los Angeles, he was working for Togo. Uh, the great Togo uh, was kind of managing him. And uh, one of the big payoffs I got in Los Angeles, <laughs> I, I told Baba what it was, and uh, he says... Togo gave me twenty five dollars. <laughs> I I got fifteen hundred. Uh, so it's a little bit different. <laughs> the payoffs that uh, Togo gave Baba, uh, but uh, it's that happened many places in the business. <laughs> Uh, well, let's talk about some of those other places you went to in the business, Mr. Byer. I'd like to go all the way back to July 11th of 1930 when you were born. Where were you born, Dick? <laughs> Where was I? I was cuddling into my mother's hands right here in Buffalo, New York. And were you born with the mask or without? <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not, uh, no, she, she, she called me Richard. <laughs> I was the and, uh, one that said I, I was the intelligent, sensational destroyer. <laughs> and I know you uh, eventually went to Syracuse to play uh, football and uh, wrestling, and you played in the Orange Bowl in 1953, but did you play any athletics in high school? Oh, yes. I <laughs> I played basketball. I tried to play basketball. I was on the team, and uh, but I, I wrestled uh, not in high school, uh, I didn't get into wrestling until I was in Syracuse. Uh, but I played uh, baseball, and I played. Uh, uh, I was a shot putter on the track team. I was a uh, all high football player. How did you evolve into a professional wrestler? 
after I'll, college. Uh, I'll tell you how I got into wrestling. My fraternity father, I belonged to a fraternity, and my fraternity father was captain of the wrestling team. His name was Howie Tice from down in Pennsylvania. And uh, he came home from practice one night, and I said, I was sitting at a card table playing Pinochle, and I used to pick up a few extra pennies playing with the fraternity brothers playing Pinochle. Anyway, uh, I asked him, I says, Howie, how did practice go today? This was in December of uh, 52, I think. He says, we had a bad day. I says, well, what was your bad day? He says, our heavyweight blew his knee out, and we don't have a heavyweight. I says, well, who's going to be your heavyweight? And he pointed at me, and he says, you. <laughs> at that time, we had four, four brothers in the house that were on the wrestling team, two of them from uh, Pennsylvania area and two of them from Oklahoma. Our fraternity house was fairly good. We, uh, they pushed the furniture back in the living room, and we got down on the rug, and they taught me how to do a uh, referee's position from a down position and an up position and started doing moves uh, until my nose got awful red. Uh, the next day I was out for wrestling, and uh, I don't know whether the rest is history, but that's exactly <laughs> the way I started into wrestling. And then I did fairly well uh, in wrestling, and uh, I, uh, the promoter in Buffalo was Ed Don George, and uh, I got into wrestling through Ed Don George, and uh, that was uh, primarily my entrance into professional wrestling. He was kind of a legendary old uh, world champion. Yes, he was. He was uh, in the he, 30s. He, here. he was on the Olympic team. Uh, yeah, Stu told me he was pretty pretty legit. Old dead Don George back maybe in the 30s. I think he was the uh, world champion uh, pre Luthez days or something like that, from what Stu told me. Yes, right. You know, if you got Matt and one of the. the the Destroyer has a great book out, which we actually sell here at the restaurant also, um, about his uh, 8,500 matches that he's done, and it goes through the history of... Uh, and his, uh, as I'm sitting here, I'm even fascinated by as long as I've known the Destroyer. I mean, the story is just... Uh, I mean, some of these I've never heard again before, and it's just like, you know, he's just the wealth of knowledge and the history of the whole pro wrestling. Um, if you don't have his book and you really want to know about wrestling from... Gorgeous George days and all the way back. It's a phenomenal book, a very great read, easy read book too, and it's just a, a fantastic history of him. And I, there were stories in there, and I looked at him, I said, I did not realize you did that for Gorgeous George. And um, you know what a what a great hero uh, chapter that is in the book about uh, what a real man uh, the Destroyer is, and what a great heart. So um, it's something if uh, Matt, if you guys uh, don't have or whatever, I'd be I'd be glad to send it to you, whatever. But you can, we have them here at the book, and I'm sure you can even get those online, right, Destroyer? I believe. I think book. so. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and it's something else. And I don't, I don't think there's a picture of his face in there without the mask. So, uh, if you're looking to see what what he really looks like without the mask, I don't think it's in the book. <laughs> so. How, how did you evolve into the Destroyer, Dick? Uh, like initially, you were just wrestling as a baby face, or uh, as your uh, Dick Byer or whatever. Or how, how did I was a baby face, you? and uh, I went into. Uh, uh, the office in uh, Buffalo. Uh, the promoter there sent me down to uh, Columbus, oh, Ohio, Don where George, Al yeah. Haft and uh, I got into wrestling with uh, Bill Miller and Joe Scarpella. They were, those were Pretty both guys, very yeah. good high school wrestlers and college wrestlers. And uh, then uh, I got to the point where I was a decent wrestler. And uh, I went up to Buffalo, and uh, that's when um, uh, Dennis's father was uh, one of the big stars. 
I was a baby face, and I I just worked kind of preliminaries, and I went into the uh, office, and I asked Ed Don George, uh, when do you think I could get a main event? And uh, he says, you're too small. I says, oh, well, I was 5'10", 210 at the time, and uh, I went uh, I went to Chicago and then to California. That's when I decided that maybe I should do something different, and I put on a mask. And uh, it didn't make any difference at that time how big or tall I was. Uh, I got to the point when I wrestled Freddie Blassie, I won the title and uh, went to Japan and wrestled Ricky Dozen and 70 million people watched the television match that I had with Ricky Dozen and uh, that kind of set my career as the destroyer on its way. After after uh, you went back to the states, Dick, did you? How did you get into Burns' promotion? That, that was uh, one of the major, probably the best territory going at that time. I would think. Yes, it was. Um, I went. Uh, I went went back to Buffalo, and uh, I was working out of Indianapolis for Bruiser, and. Uh, Anyway, I was working for Dick the Bruiser out of uh, Indianapolis, and uh, I got booked in Chicago by uh, Bruiser and Snyder. Wilbur Snyder was the, his partner. And, oh, yeah, uh, Wilbur Snyder. He started up here first two in 52 or something with Kaniski and Blanchard. They were kind of football players, too, from... Yeah. Yeah, they were, and uh, so I uh, worked. Um, I worked against Vern Gagne in Chicago as the destroyer, and uh, it's we had a a big house. Uh, it was sold out, and uh, Vern told me uh, in the dressing room that uh, he'd like to have me come to Minneapolis, uh, but he didn't want the destroyer. Oh, I said to him, uh, well, why don't you want the destroyer? He says, I want a mask, man, but come in with a different mask. I says, why? He says, well, everybody knows that uh, the destroyer is Dick Byer. Oh, I says, who's Dick Byer? He didn't make any money. Uh, I says, uh, who's he? And uh, anyway, I went in the next week uh, with a bag on my head, and I put an X on it, just a paper bag. Uh, you buy in a, <laughs> you get your groceries in in a supermarket, uh, and I put a, a couple holes in the face and an X on the mask. Or so, uh, so I went in the studio audience, and I sat in the studio audience watching the. Saturday afternoon uh, wrestling show that was uh, on in Minneapolis, and uh, Marty Marty O'Neill came over as a ring announcer, not a ring, as a commentator. Asked me, "Well, who was I?" I says, "It's none of your business who I am. I'm Doctor X." So anyway. <laughs> A couple of weeks went by. I jumped in the ring and put the figure four leg lock on Vern Gagne, and that's how I got into Minneapolis as uh, Doctor X. And uh, it was it was a I didn't like the move at the time, but it made money. And believe it or not, uh, I have a golf course here in Buffalo, New York, called. Destroyer Park Golf. A lot of the things that we sell at Destroyer Park Golf is Dr. X shirts because there was a singer, Blondie, that yeah, Harry, wore yeah, my Debbie shirt Harry, yeah. <laughs> when she sang in nightclubs. And uh, 
so I, I, I'm making a little money now <laughs> as Dr. X through my golf course. <laughs> and I think there might have been a, a Dr. X before that that Vern Gagne wrestled before the uh, the AWA even started. Have you have you ever heard of that, Dick? Yes, I did. Bill Miller was. Bill Miller, that's right. And did that have any influence on you when you put the X on your head, or was it just uh, happened? It, it, I at that particular time, I didn't know that Bill Miller wore a mask in Minneapolis as Doctor X, but I did know after I did it. But uh, it had no influence at all on myself. Well, I want to go back a little bit into the 1950s when you were still just Dick Byer. I know you uh, worked down in Mid-America and were the uh, Southern Tag Champs down there with uh, two different gentlemen named Tex Riley and Len Roth. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience, if you have any memories of it? Oh, sure I do. I mean, that was that was probably Tex Riley and Len Rossi were great wrestlers in the South, and they picked me as tag team partners at various events down for Nick Goulas. Uh, and uh, I just got, just read something about Len Rossi in uh, one of my Christmas cards. Uh, somebody in that area of uh, New York, uh, this fellow, Bob Bryla, Bob Bryla had mentioned him. Len Rossi was a big fan of his, or he was a big fan of Len Rossi uh, back in uh, 57 or 8 or 9, somewhere there. He was a huge uh, star down there, wasn't he, uh, Dick? Len Rossi. Uh, baby oh, baby. yeah. He was. He wrestled down there, and uh, I don't think he wrestled in too many other territories because Nick Goulas had a big territory down there, and he, he went all over the place. And Tex Riley was uh, an older wrestler at the time. He and uh, Tex Riley and Len Rossi became great tag team partners. You weren't doing the uh, Destroyer at that time, were you just Dick Byers then? Or? No, I, the Destroyer wasn't even born. He's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And uh, I'm told that you were also brother-in-law with another major star, uh, Billy Red Lions. Is that right? Oh, it's right. It uh, Billy uh, passed away four or five years ago uh, up here, and he was from Canada, and that's another yeah, that's reason like, why uh, I uh, associate nice myself guy. with the Canadians. Yeah, like one of the, I, I've been one up of the to. Really nice Toronto many times, and uh, it's uh, Billy Red Lions was uh, a great friend of mine, and he was a little ticked off at me because I introduced him to his wife, (laughs) 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 and he says, "Why did you do that?" You know, (laughs) introducing him to his wife. Now, I know that you and Dan Manakian uh, are the longest reigning WWA tag team champions in history. You guys held those belts for 230 days, which is quite a bit longer than anybody else. You guys must have had a hell of a run down there in uh, 62 and 63 in Los Angeles. Uh, yes, we did. Uh, he uh, he was a great wrestler. Uh, he, he passed away this last year. I get a a letter from uh, Burke. Um, uh, 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 help me out. I need a first name. Tom Burke. Uh, he Tom, sends out the uh, letter that uh, people that passed away in the past years. He always sends one Tom out, Burke. and uh, it uh, <laughs> this past Tom, one was, I think. 39 wrestlers that passed away this past year. So uh, he says, you're not on the list yet. (laughs) (laughs) He'll let you know. 
Well, I know in uh, in 1963 you made your way to uh, the Owen family promotion here in the Pacific Northwest where you held uh, two heavyweight titles, wrestling against men like Mad Dog Vachon, Tony Bourne, and Nick Bockwinkle, and you held three tag titles with, now forgive me if I pronounce this gentleman's name wrong, Art McCallick? Art Mahalik. Art Mahalik. Uh, Art uh, played with the, uh, he was a football player too, as a linebacker. Yeah, I remember he was. And uh, he's still alive on the West Coast. He lives in, uh, I get a Christmas card from him, and he was a great wrestler. We call him Boom Boom Mahalik. Art Boom Boom Mahalik. He seemed like a good guy, old Art. Uh, my dad had great things to say about him. Tell me, uh, Dick, when did you hook up with uh, Ray Stevens? Uh, I remember meeting Ray a few times. He always spoke very well of you. Ray was probably one of the best professional wrestlers as a baby face. And then he worked heel many times. But um, oh, I met Ray in, when I first uh, went into wrestling in Columbus, Ohio. Because I think, I think Ray was born someplace around Ohio. Uh, I'm not sure... But uh, but Ray was a, a a great he was probably the number one baby face that when he went to a territory they put him on top when Dick Byer went to a pair <laughs> went to a territory I I worked the preliminaries <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then worked your way up I'm also told Dick uh, my old buddy Terry Funk. Uh, and Dory Jr., who are well, good buddies of mine, told me they they worked a lot with you back in the day and had high regard for you. The most favorite person that I like to watch was Terry Funk. <laughs> I've seen I've seen probably ten of his retirement matches in Japan. <laughs> He, they would announce that he's going to retire and he'd wrestle against Anoki or uh, different wrestlers in Japan. Uh, he's going to be his retirement match. I watched one of his retirement matches with uh, the Butcher, Abdullah the Butcher. <laughs> I think I had a that, retirement the, match with Terry up here myself. And, uh <laughs> And a few years later, he was. I think I had another one with him up in uh, up in Michigan or someplace like that. You know, so, I don't know who else. I, did you ever have any retirement matches with Terry yourself, Dick? Or? No, I didn't. I didn't. I had many matches with him and and Dory too, but uh, I never had a, a retirement match with him. Maybe I had, it was young. Do you, and do you want to have one with him? Because I think Terry, we could arrange that. I know Terry's not doing anything at CAC this year. Well, why don't we put it on at the CAC? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that might be the uh, some match to end all retirement matches. <laughs> and listen, uh, this is Bob, uh, Dick, uh, this is Bob here. I've got a, I got a caller t- uh, co- from... Uh, uh, Harold from Mississauga, Ontario. He says, "Can you ask Dick, as one of the uh, few people alive who, ever, who knew gorgeous George, uh, that to tell us a good gorgeous? I guess you had wrestled gorgeous George a few times and knew him quite well." Yeah. The first gorgeous George match I had was in Birmingham, Alabama, and I was Dick Byer. And Freddie Blassie was on the card, I can remember, because I wrestled Freddie earlier in that uh, my term in uh, Tennessee. I say Tennessee, I wrestled him in Birmingham, but uh, Birmingham happened to be one of the towns that was uh, promoted by Nick Goulas. And uh, Nick was the promoter through the uh, south there. And then I next wrestled uh, Gorgeous George uh, in Hawaii. How was he to work with old Gorgeous George? Was he Gorgeous George was all right. He was a he could wrestle, and uh, yeah, Stu told me he was 
not a bad amateur. He said he was pretty. Uh, the uh, the fact that he could wrestle most of the time when I worked with somebody, I did more wrestling than uh, a lot of people, uh, and uh, I could wrestle like even Lou says. You know, you got Lou was a. A great worker, but if you wrestle them, you had a better match. And Mio Mascaris was another one. Uh, uh, I wrestled with Mio, but uh, Stu Hart, uh, or Gorgeous George, <laughs> Stu Hart, I, I, I didn't wrestle against your dad. <laughs> uh, but uh, Gorgeous George was a great wrestler, and... Uh, I uh, I stopped by one day on my way to Bakersfield and I uh, I talked to him and uh, there wasn't that many people in the bar and uh, I asked him I says do you do pretty good business he says yeah about five six o'clock we we do pretty good business I says you know uh, he says but I could use a payday so I says uh, what do you mean. He says, I'd like to have a mask versus hair mask with you. And uh, so we worked it out. He he had mentioned this to Jules Strongbow, and Jules didn't think it would draw. Uh, he didn't think that the mask against his hair would draw. But anyway, we had the, ma we had the match. He got his uh, hairdressers to shave him in the ring in Los Angeles. And then we had a return match in, uh, for Hardy Cruise Camp down in Long Beach with the bald, uh, uh, gorgeous Ted. George uh, against the mask. And uh, I says, well, I'm not going to take the mask off. And he says, no, I'll cut my hair. So that's the way that went along. And uh, you remember the year that was in? In the early 60s, Stu told me he had, uh, you know, some personal problems in the latter stages. I'm not sure if it was drinking. Uh, he drank or... a little bit. Yeah, he uh, uh, passed away December 26, 1963. Jeez, uh, 11 yeah. days after Ricky Dozan was murdered. Well, that's a, Stu told that's a couple of good draws. <laughs> yeah. R Ricky was the number one man in Japan, and Gorgeous George was uh, the number one guy all over the United States. Did you have any history with the McMahons, uh, Dick, or good, bad, or...? or... It's very short. Uh, I, I promoted a couple of towns for uh, the McMahons, uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, or one of those, uh, but I never... The reason I never worked for uh, McMahon's was that uh, a masked man could not wrestle in the United in uh, New York. For some reason, they didn't allow masked men. When I had the mask on and was drawing in uh, Minnesota and California and Oregon, they didn't let a masked man wrestle in New York State. I often wondered, you know, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, as you said, I never ever noticed any mask guys, and but uh, I didn't know that was just something Vince Senior and Junior didn't like mask guys. I didn't know that it was some kind of uh, commission uh, eating. No, I don't think it, they had didn't like the mask guy because uh, Mil Mascaris, uh, he came very popular, and they brought him in. <laughs> and I'm sure that they had a big influence on the commission to have Neil Mascaris come in as mask man. And he he broke the mask man as far as wrestling in New York State. One of my tag team partners just came in the room. <laughs> my son, <laughs> Kurt. <laughs> he's, oh. he's here and living in Buffalo now and if I had his size when I went in to uh, see Pedro way back when, he's six, six, three, four, five, 
something like that. <laughs> weighs, a, weighs about 300 pounds. I could have worked in New York State earlier. I was going to ask you, Dick, uh, is that uh, the, same, the same son who uh, you and your son uh, scaled that building in uh, Niagara Falls? That's, that's the same son. Tell us a little that's bit about the same the son. That that's the same son. That was my tag team partner on my Sayonara match in Japan. I worked uh, a tag team match with him in uh, Japan against uh, Giant Baba and uh, one of the other Japanese wrestlers. Anyway, uh, he turned out good. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, Baba wouldn't man. use him as uh, under the mask. He wanted him to wrestle as Kurt Beyer. So he didn't. He didn't wear so that very much after that. I know you're about you're about five ten in your prime there, Dick. Yep. How big was Ricky? Uh, not much bigger. Uh, he weighed about two forty, I think. What was the secret of uh, Ricky Dozan's success, Dick? What made him such a big thing over there? Like I've, I've seen his work, you know. And back then, it was a lot, lot less flamboyant and all like that. But what seemed to be the thing that made him? Uh, such well, he a was icon? a sumo wrestler. He was uh, a, a very successful sumo wrestler, uh, and he went into pro wrestling and probably one of the first ones. Uh, Jumbo Ceruto was a uh, another a wrestler who was a professional and very good one. He was, he came into it uh, as a uh, a judo. I met I met him with the Funks back in the seventies. He was breaking in. Yeah, he he uh, worked your territory. Yeah, for what some reason that? my dad had uh, my dad became like the dumping grounds for all the young Japanese. Guys, back in the day, I think Anoki and Bab- Baba used to uh, send all the green ones up here, and uh, quite a few of them went on to become big stars. You know, they'd be up here. I think my dad had uh, my dad had so many Japanese guys at one stage. I, I was booking at that time that, for him. That was a good I thing think, that your father did. He used those I boys, the and they, they became good wor- workers. Because yeah, I think my dad was like the uh, developmental place for everyone. I think Vern Gagne would send uh, guys up here, and uh, the Funks would send guys up here, and Don Owens would send up, and all, all the French Canadian guys were breaking in up here as from Pedro, the past. Pedro on. Martinez, he didn't uh, send any Dick Byer up there. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're right. My father always told stories of you. You got into your house, and then uh, when you worked, and when they worked out with uh, with your dad and down at what was it called at one point? Was it the dungeon down there? Did they call it or yeah. something? That, yeah, I think, and, uh, I think Fritz von Erich was up here around that time. Fritz and Ilya were together, and uh, Fritz had a house trailer, like a little trailer out in the yard, my dad's house, and there was like chickens and cows and. Horses and stuff wandering around the yard, and uh, kind of like Beverly Hillbillies. And uh, I think uh, Fritz's wife, uh, Doris, was always uh, coming in and commiserating with my mother. I remember I was a little kid then, and uh, and Fritz and them would be on the road, and uh, the wives would be kind of. Uh, kind of my dad's place was way out in the country in those days, so it's kind of like. My mother always used to refer to us a cross between the Beverly Hillbillies and the Adams family, or our, our, uh, <laughs> our house. With I remember the rest of us used to always come up and back in those days to get their payoffs on Saturdays. And my dad was adamant that they uh, kayfabe or you know so they're always staying in character. And uh, I remember. Uh, we were little kids, and we thought these uh, you could see these Mad Dog Vashons. Uh, I think Fritz von Erich at that time was playing some kind of a, a Nazi or whatever, and kind of like something out of uh, Hogan's Heroes or something like that, you know. And uh, but it's kind of fascinating to see all these. Uh, there's always a few uh, 
kind of strange ones like Sky High Lee and uh, some of those guys that were perpetual. I think Dr. Jerry Graham was up here around that time, and he was uh, more often than not uh, inebriated. And, <laughs> and it, it was uh, it was kind of strange to see this kind of menagerie coming in every Saturday, and uh, you know, kind of. Bald headed lady wrestlers and uh, maybe it, I think maybe it, that's the place that Vern Gagne got his uh, education because um, he used to say uh, when I was with somebody without the mask on he'd say K Fave K Fave everything was K Fave. Oh yeah, it was it was funny back in those days. Uh, like Stu had them all doing that. It, he didn't want uh, us kids to pick up on any of the thing, and uh, I remember the villains were always kind of playing, you know, obnoxious types around us, you know, hard-boiled Haggerty and guys like that, you know, and Bob Orton Sr., I'd see them, and uh, I, I thought they really were kind of jerks, and I think I saw about 30 years later... <laughs> I ran into a hard you, oil you weren't far and, from wrong either. <laughs> I, I met some of them at CAC years later, and uh, I was surprised they seemed like pretty nice guys. Then, you know. but, yeah, that was a different era then, uh, as far as just uh, you know the way guys would kayfabe and stay in character and go to all, all these lengths to uh, you know not let the fans have any uh, insight into any. Any of it being a work or whatever, you know. Yeah. yeah. It was great that we had uh, great lives as we, uh, Bruce, a lot like my, my dad when we grew up. You're right, the wrestlers would come over and different things would always be the, uh, it was always be around the holiday or something else. I remember Bruno and uh, Dominic Danucci saying uh, we lived in a trailer at the time and I was showing my son where we lived and Bruno, I said, Bruno, you were, you were at my father's trailer for a little picnic when we were kids. He goes, sure, I remember. I go, but my son can't believe we all fit in a in a little three-bedroom trailer in a trailer park. He goes, yeah, we used to say, spend a lot of time and sleep over in your father's trailer. There was always a lot of room. And <laughs> my son and I were looking. <laughs> really, Dominic, my father, along with two kids, cats, dogs, animals, and there was, oh, sure, your father had a lot of room for us. We always spend the night that we were in Buffalo. So, uh, you know, it was always pretty neat that the wrestlers would come around and uh, the house was always open. But it was uh, pretty neat to see all these guys. But you're right, keeping the character all the time. That's why the Destroyer would always bring, remember when you bring Andre the Giant in and um, um, uh, what was it, Bob Robertson, whether from um, uh, Richardson and from Japan, and they would come in and it would always be after hours. And then they sit and then the stories would flow as well as the food and the wine and it would get better. We'd be here till four o'clock in the morning, telling stories and catching up. But uh, after hours is uh, when the hair was let down. It was uh, a lot of fun, and and the mask was off. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, I always had great respect for Dick. Uh, I remember I saw Dick at CAC a few times, and uh, he always had the mask on. He was still kind of old school in that respect, you know. Nowadays, you know, if you're any mask guy, you know, everybody knows who they are, what they look like, or whatever. But uh, I remember the first time I ever saw Dick without the mask on. I was down at CAC, and I said, who's that? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> and somebody said, oh, it's Dick Byer. And I said, geez, uh, the only image of him I ever had was with the mask. I had seen him many a time, and like, whoa, you know, I, <laughs> it was kind of yeah. funny, but... Now, I know you brought up uh, Fritz von Erich's name here a couple minutes ago, and I wanted to ask, I know uh, Dick and the Golden Terror held tag belts uh, down in Dallas, uh, wrestling guys like Duke Keomaka and uh, Kenji Anoki. Was that for Fritz? Was he uh, running by then? Fritz became the promoter, and then actually Fritz von Erich and Ilio DiPaolo and the Destroyer, or Dick Fire, were he bought the territory from Pedro Martinez up here in Rochester. Oh. And Ilio was the baby face. Fritz was the heel. And I was the television commentator on the television station in Rochester. So we worked a few well, shows and we did very well with them. But uh, Pedro wanted the territory back again. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So we sold it back to him. We, we, I think we made a profit. <laughs> I was going to ask you about one other old name that always used to mention your name, Dick, a guy named uh, Jesse Ortega that was up here for a long time. And he said he was a dear friend of yours, uh, wrestled under the name of the Mighty Ursus. He was big, and uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, he did certain things... But with me, he always wrestled. His gimmick was he was strong and big. I would put that over as we went in the match, but I would also continue with the wrestling. And I think that's why he liked it. I just remember when I was a little kid, Mighty Ursus was always uh, up here. He's good friend of my dad's but he, he was always raving about you and uh always begging my dad to get destroyer up here and all of that and, uh, but I remember, and, he wouldn't, uh, and he wouldn't book me huh well my dad said you were too expensive he, he said that you were making <laughs> well, my dad said you were making too much money wherever else so he uh, kind of forged you or something but <laughs> Uh, let me let me tell you one little story about working in Tennessee. Uh, in Tennessee, if you went on TV and you uh, were going to win, you got twenty five bucks. But if you're going to lose, you only got ten. <laughs> so I worked <laughs> Tennessee television. <laughs> My biggest payoff was ten bucks. <laughs> what was there? There must have been some uh, political conflict there if you were getting paid less, you know, even less incentive That's right. to do the job. <laughs> yeah, was that, that was for uh, Nick Goulas, or I was always that told was Nick for was Nick little, I was always told he was a little uh, tight with the uh, payoffs, as they say, you know. And, uh, you you used the wrong adjective. He wasn't a little. He was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's true. Because my mom has all this. She's got the book of my father's paydays when they got married. Right, the destroyer. And it's amazing. I looked through that book, and back in the fifties and sixties, you're right. Ten dollars, five dollars. I mean, they just have enough gas to get to Toronto. The rest, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, stop at a roadside. And my mother said she'd order a sandwich, and knowing that you know your father was, uh, you know, hungry and had to keep his strength, she'd take one bite and said, "I'm full," and give it the rest <laughs> to my father so he could eat to keep the strength. Because there wasn't that much money; you just had enough gas to get going there until you you got to the main events and you got to to get the money. But but you're right. I looked through that book. Our kids, we all look at it. And go, oh my gosh, I can't. How did you survive back then? But uh, but you just did. There's no doubt about it, destroyer. And, Bruce, your dad, and all of them. I mean, it's a, it's a phenomenal how they've they've taken that industry and to make it what it is today. What we watch on TV and all, and the the roots where it all started back in the back in those days are phenomenal. I would like to hope. I don't know that I'm accurate, but I'd like to hope that Vince McMahon and some of them uh, have some appreciation for that, you know. And uh, and frankly, you know, uh, both Ilio and Dick. By that token, should be in that uh, WWE Hall of Fame. You know, you know, it's people like that that uh, you know legitimately uh, laid the groundwork, and you know, were were the guys. You know, it kind of pains me when I see some of the guys they they are inducting into that Hall of Fame. That no knock on them, but guys like the Godfather and Medusa and people like that. You know, and it, you know, it's somewhat of an affront that they're not. Or even like a Luthes is not in the Hall of Fame, or uh, yeah. you know, some of those guys. You know, it, uh, it the, kind of makes uh, you wonder about it. Yeah, the thing that gets me uh, right now is you know, the, some of the guys get a million dollars. I said, "Holy Christ, a million dollars!" <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly like you were saying, you know, with uh, one bite out of the sandwich and all like that, you know, it's, you know, a, a different world. But uh, I'm hoping that some of the, uh, some of the wrestlers at least have some respect and gratitude for, you know, people like Ilio and, and yourself and Stu and all who, uh, 
kind of paved the way for them, you know. Not, I'm not sure if they do, to be quite honest, but I would hope they do. That's what I love about the CAC. I mean, I went with the Destroyer last year, and, and, I, and frankly, because, you know, we were talking with the Destroyer, and I said, I haven't been out there in years, and I said to get out there to see everybody, and it's uh, what that organization alone is, is the backbone of the, the pro wrestling industry and the history, and, you know, I got to meet Bob and all of you out there, but it, it's, you know, that's when you really appreciate the, the sport of wrestling and, and what it's done, and, and what and when you look at what it's meant to so many people's lives, I mean, it's, uh, it's really been... Uh, it's something to see that uh, you know everybody has their sports heroes, but needless to say, every single person growing up had their wrestling hero. I mean, everybody. I don't care who they were, uh, was, but uh, even today, everybody has their sports heroes. Any any kids at all? So it's uh, yeah, you're right. I, I hope like you're right, Bruce, that, that Vince does understand and that uh, where it was all started right in the beginning of TV when it all started right there was uh, what happened. So. There's a few names out there that just don't get brought up very often, and uh, having Mr. Byer on the show, he can maybe give us some insight into these gentlemen and their careers and their lives. Uh, I'd probably start with Nick Kozak. Nick Kozak? Yes, sir. Was he a good worker? He was a fantastic worker, but I think he was smaller than I was, you know? Mm -hmm. And if uh, a promoter in Buffalo said, you're too small, well, there's... Some promoters, they wouldn't book people. Uh, they didn't book me, I know. But uh, Nick Kozak was a was a was a great worker. What about he was a Canadian Tony originally, Born. wasn't he? Oh, Tony Bourne! Holy Christ, he's the toughest guy in Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> Tough Tony. Oh, Tony Born, was yeah. great. He was man. You had to be somebody else to. Uh, uh, you got to be somebody better than Tony Bourne to get Don Owens to book you in the main event. <laughs> <laughs> Our pal Alec and I used working? to say, hey, Don, when are you going to put us ahead of Tony Bourne? <laughs> Tony Bourne was a, a great local wrestler that uh, did terrific. Uh, I'm not sure. If he made a good living uh, in uh, working in Oregon, but Tony Bourne was a, a terrific tough guy. Uh, he he beat anybody. <laughs> I know you got to wrestle uh, in the Northwest. You got to wrestle a very young Nicholas Bockwinkle. He had a father that was a wrestler. Warren Buckling. So I'm sure that he had to live up to his father's reputation as he was growing up. <laughs> and uh, but uh, I I worked against uh, Nick Bockwinkle in several different territories: Texas, L.A., Oregon. Nick Bockwinkle was probably the correct size to be a professional wrestler. He wasn't small. He wasn't real big, uh, but he could he could wrestle. Uh, he could do all the moves. He could find head scissors, drop kick. Uh, Nick was always a, a wrestler that had everything. Now, what about uh, uh, Elton Owen, the promoter from Eugene, Oregon, who was Don Owen's brother? Everybody's got an Elton Owen story. <laughs> I got a good one. <laughs> I, I was wrestling against uh, Mil Mascaris in Eugene, Oregon. So I got together in the dressing room with uh, Mil Mascaris, and I says, Mil, we're going to do a half-shoot match. We're going to go out there and really wrestle but not to the point where we're going to get ourselves all tired out. So we went out there, and we started doing false finishes, and uh, Elton Owen was the referee and also the ring announcer. We proceeded to get him dead tired refereeing, getting down and up and down and up, Count three, get up, get out, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> he says, 
when we got back to the dressing room, he says, you dirty bastards, you were, <laughs> you were working with me. <laughs> the best thing that ever happened to me is that I got into pro wrestling, and I got to know the people like Ilio DiPaolo and Art Mahalik and so thanks for letting me talk tonight. I appreciate everything, and I'll see you the next time I look at you. <laughs>